So last night I got home and um, went to my chair, as I often do in the living room. And I uh, needed to get up and get to uh, a different room. And so you need to know that our, our house has one step down from, I guess it's the dining room, whatever you want to call that room or whatever. But, so it has one step down into the living room. And last night when I was attempting to make that step, uh, the step didn't function. And therefore, I, I went face first on the floor, and my glasses are like super bowed out. Not to mention, it kind of went back in here and all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't planning to do a fall in order to do this sermon. Um, but I thought, as long as I was doing this sermon, if I talked about it, then workman's comp would kick in. <sighs> yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I just, that first, that fall, and, and Sandy goes, she's real helpful. She goes, uh, why didn't you put your hands out? <laughs> I don't know. I just fell. So I'm not sure what happened. But the first step truly was a doozy. And, and I will, um, there's kind of a little thing back here. I, I had some people look at me during services and check me out to make sure I'd be all right and so forth. But falling isn't what I intended to do, but I know that I'm still going to be okay. I want us to take a look at the passage of Scripture this morning, not just where we, where we parked at in Matthew 14, but we're going to go back a little bit further. Uh, you need to know that this, this passage of Scripture begins with Jesus receiving um, word from one of his, uh, John's disciples. So I don't think it was, I don't think it was a telegram. I don't think it was a text message. So it was one of G John's disciples, John the Baptist. So if, if you all know, and some of you do, that John the Baptist and Jesus have, are related in some fashion or another. Some people say that they're cousins. Remember that um, John's mom is, John's mom and dad are Elizabeth and Zacharias. Who and they have John before Jesus does, and so you, and Mary goes to visit them. You all know this story, right? Good, because some of you look like. So, so here, so here's what's gone on. So John, Jesus knows that John has been arrested. John has been arrested because of his faith in God, how he is showing his faith in God. And so he's been arrested by um, Herod. Herod is there back in Jerusalem. Jesus at this point is out, out by the Sea of Galilee. So Jerusalem's in the south part of, of Israel. Um, the Sea of Galilee is on the north part of, of Israel. And so that's where Jesus and his group is hanging out. John and his group has been hanging out here, except now he's been arrested. Herod, has, Herod is throwing this big party. And um, his, his daughter comes, and, and she does this wonderful dance. She's better than dancing with a star. She doesn't even have a partner. Okay, so Salome is dancing along, and Herod is feeling no pain. And he says, oh, and everybody thinks that Salome's dance was great. And, so the, and Herod goes, oh, honey, whatever you want, I will give you. I give you my oath, whatever you want. And Salome goes, well, I don't know what I want. I don't know. You know, he's thinking new dress, and, you know, something like that, a new phone, whatever it is. But she goes back, talks to her mom. Her mom is kind of, yeah, she's not been in such great relationship with John the Baptist because he made fun of her and whatever. And so her feelings are hurt. And so she says, go tell your dad that what you want is John the Baptist's head on a platter. So Salome comes dancing back into dad and Herod goes, so what do you want, honey? What do you want? And he goes, I, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And Herod's going, it's not what I was quite thinking. I was thinking like new shoes or something, but... But I made an oath, and all these people are watching, and so, okay. So he caves into his daughter's request. for He doesn't really want to kill John the Baptist, because it couldn't, not only does he not really want that, but this death could make havoc in the city. Regardless, that's what he orders. And later on in the dinner party, John the Baptist his head arrives on a platter for all the guests to see and for Salome to take back to her mom. 
Now, John the Baptist has disciples. Disciples are just followers, okay? He has followers, and those followers know that Jesus is up north in the cabin, lake country. So they go up to go and say, we need to let him know what's going on. And so they come to Jesus, and they say, we, we need to let you know that, that John is, is gone. And this is what happened. So Jesus has just received this news that this devout follower of God, his cousin, his blood relation, has been killed, and in large part because of his faith in God. So Jesus wants to go off alone, presumably to pray and to think and to grieve. But, in the midst of this, there's all these people who are around the lake, and they've all heard about Jesus, and they've heard about the great things that he's done, and so they come up, hey, Jesus, oh, you're Jesus, right? Jesus, I have a cousin over here. She really could use your help. You know, she's got this and that and the other thing, and we heard that you did great things, and so could, is it all right for me to br bring her here, bring her here? So br she brings the cousin, and then there's someone else who has a second cousin over there, and then, oh, yeah, I bring my mom, and so all of a sudden, Jesus is flooded by all these, these requests of people who are looking for healing healing. Now, mind you, they aren't listening or wanting any kind of anything else. They want what he can give to feel better. And so all of them have crowd around, and Jesus, the scripture tells us this, Jesus had compassion on the crowd, and he healed them. So it's getting later in the day. All these people are milling around, and one of Jesus' disciples comes up and says, Jesus, by the way, uh, uh, it's getting late. Well, I guess they would have looked at a sundial instead, whatever. So it's getting late. It's getting late, and uh, you, you should send these people home so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus says, uh, it's not going to work like that. You feed them. And the <laughs> we can't. Jesus, we don't. You're you're crazy. You know, we're, we're not gonna. We don't have any. We don't have anything that we could feed them with. And Jesus goes, "Well, go out into the crowd and find out what's there." So somebody goes out, probably just one who already knows that there's not enough. You all know this type, right? I know there's not enough. So I'll prove him. And they come up and here's five loaves of bread. Five. And two fish from a kid. From a kid, we're taking, money, we're taking food from a kid. And Jesus blesses the food. And you know the story, right? Just say yes. Right? It's all broken up. People all get to eat. There's, there's more than enough. There's baskets left over, baskets enough to make a casserole the next day. <laughs> so this is over, and now Jesus wants to go away to pray by himself. So this is where, where we parked this morning. Remember, Jesus goes away by himself. The disciples, he says, get in the boat, just get in the boat. Go to the next place. The 12 of you just go out. I'll, I'll make it there. Just get in the boat, get. So Jesus goes off into the hills. They get into the boat, and they go rowing to the next place. And then a storm comes up. It says the winds buffet the, the ship. The, it's not really much of a ship. It's just a boat. So the 12 of them are in this boat, and the storm comes up. Now this, by the way, it's, it's not unlikely for this to happen on the Sea of Galilee, where, where storms can just kind of whip up like that any place, where, and, and they don't get any weather alerts or anything like that. There's nothing on their cell phones that come across, or the weather radios that beep. There's nothing like that. And so they are, they are trying to get either to the other side or go back to the shore that they're in, but it doesn't make any difference. The, the wind is just rocking them around. And Jesus sees that. And so he comes, he comes down from the hills, goes out on the shore, and he starts to walk across the water. Now the people in the boat, the disciples, see 
they know that it, they, they see it's Jesus, but they say, it can't be, it can't be, it's, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. I don't care how many times you've been in that rocking boat, the disciples had just, just five hours ago witnessed Jesus blessing that food, seeing people more, have more than enough to eat. Not long before that, they had seen thousands, hundreds of people come looking for healing, and Jesus had healed all those people. They saw that. They experienced, they were there. And yet they don't believe that that could possibly be Jesus walking on the water, coming to them. They even have scripture behind us, which we have scripture behind us too, but we don't have it in the same kind of memory recollection that they would have. In the Psalms, in the Old Testament, it says many different times that Jesus, that God will rescue us. He walks upon the water. He will not let us be overwhelmed by the flood. Check it out, it's there. And they knew that too, but they are crying out, it's a ghost. And then there's Peter. So this is all going on. And Jesus says this. Let's just check it out again. So I'm going to invite us to, to say the same things that Jesus said. He said, take courage. Say that. Take courage. Take courage. It, is I. it is I. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Peter says, Lord, if it's you... Tell me to come to you on the water. Now, I want you to think about not, not being Peter, about the other 11 in the boat. They're, Peter, shut up. What are you doing? We don't want to. If he tells you to go out there, then he's going to tell us to go out there, and I don't know. No, no, no. They would rather be in the boat with the storm than to get out of the boat. They are so mad at Peter, which is so typical of what Peter does all the time. He is constantly pushing. He is constantly saying things that he might regret, or at least the other disciples wish that he wouldn't say. And then the, Jesus says, come. Will you say that? Come. Come. Peter then takes a step out of the boat. Now this sermon is entitled, The First Step is a Doozy. Which leads us to think that when we take that step out, that's what's going to... Uh, somehow make us fall into the water. That first step, we, you're, you're going to fall somehow. But that's not what happens here, right? When, Paul, when Peter gets out of the boat, does he fall into the water at that point? No. But I can tell you what, the first step still is a doozy. Because it means getting out of a place even when we're in the midst of a storm, even when you think that the, storm, the, the waves may overwhelm you and you, you, at least you know what it's like here in the boat. And so we hold on like this. And the first step is to get out of the boat. Because it's Jesus who is saying, come. Now you know the rest of the story. Peter gets out of the boat. And I want you to think for a moment what it might be like for, for any of us to climb out of that boat. Because when you get out of that boat, I can tell you it's not going to feel like it's cement underneath your feet. There are going to be waves around you. It, you're going to feel like, ah, it's kind of squishy. 
It's not like walking on this. It's not even like walking on ice, which Minnesotans can say that we walk on water all the time, right? <laughs> it's not like that, though. It's kind of mushy. And you don't know what's going to happen next. So Peter gets out. Both feet. And he looks right at Jesus. And he walks. Until the scripture says that he notices the wind around him. He loses focus on Christ and he begins to sink. And just as importantly, he cries out, Lord, save me. And what does Jesus do? Immediately, he reaches out and he holds his hand. The doozy is just getting out of the boat. The falling is nearly inevitable. All of us are going to fail at times. All of us, at some point or another, are going to fall flat on our face like I did in our, in our dining room. Now, I know that I will have to go to Costco sometime later. I will show them my eyeglasses. They will go, what happened to you? And, you, and I'll tell them some little story that my wife pushed me, and then... <laughs> and they won't care, because they're just making polite conversation anyway. And then they will adjust my, my frames to refit my face. I know they won't charge me. Even though I got my glasses there, I didn't get my frames there, and they won't ask any questions. See, I know, I know all these things. I've been there before. I know I can trust in that. I know that even if my frames would have shattered and the lenses would have went kaput, I know that within a couple of days, I would have gotten another pair of glasses. They may not have had the nice little frames that I have now, but everything would still be fine. I, I know that because I've done it enough and I trust enough and I've seen... Uh, I, I have faith because of the things I've already experienced. Peter needed faith for things he had yet to know about. Oh, it's not just Pete, by the way. It's us. We need that same kind of faith. Knowing fully that Jesus will always be there. Yes, we might be able to take a couple of steps. Maybe we'll get, make it all the way across the lake. Or maybe we'll just make two steps and we'll go right into the lake. I don't care. Jesus says, I'm always there and I will rescue you. Oh, by the way, he's already done it. Time and time and time again. Look back, reflect a bit on your own life and go, yeah. Oh, yeah, the, I can see that God was working in that. I, oh, yeah, that, that just can't be a coincidence that all that stuff happened at that particular time. There were people who came alongside and uh, God used them. I, yeah, it may not always be the way that we plan it to be. It may not always work out with the same kind of results that if, well, if I was doing it, I would have done it that way. I mean... We say those things to God all the time. It, it, first of all, it's okay to talk to God like that. Read the Psalms. There are some of the people in the Psalms who are saying a lot worse things to God than that. God, that doesn't put your, your love and God's love in jeopardy at all. It makes us real. But God still says, you know what? I'm here. Always have always will be. And you can trust getting out of that boat. Now, a couple of weeks ago, many of you received in the mail this card. Uh, I, have your, I give you my word card, which is a way for you to um, show this particular congregation that, that you're going to take a risk, something different with your finances and some of you are going, oh, this is where that part comes in. All right, I got you. I, 
Can I just tell you, I don't care where it is that you park your finances for God's sake. I invite you just to, to do it. To risk something that you have yet to do. Whatever that might be. Scripture tells us time and time again that everything that we have is God's. And so, and God just says, will, will you trust me with what I've already given you? And will you give it back and see if I won't multiply it, won't bless you time and time again? That's what this is about. If you'd like to make it to this church and to say, okay, I'm going to risk doing something else. Now, you might fall. You might fail. It may not, you may go, oh, yeah, I'm going to give the, the church $1,000 a week. Any, any takers? Just check in. Okay. I'm going to give them $1,000 a week. And then the very next week you go, oh, I guess I can't do that. Well, I can tell you what. Have you ever, has anyone ever watched, uh, I forget, I think it's the meaning of life, Monty Python's meaning of life. So, so there's this, this little segment in there where a guy has, um, he, he wrote on one of his cards that he was going to donate his liver. All right? So he's, gonna, he's a liver don't. So, so there, there's an apartment, and two guys are knocking at the door, and he opens the door, and they say, we're here for your liver. <laughs> well, I'm not done with my liver. Yeah, it's, it's right here on the card. Uh, we're here for your liver. God doesn't do that, friends. His wife was in the background and said, I said he shouldn't get that liver. I said he shouldn't be doing anything with that card, which is kind of a southern part of England there, whatever. Um, <laughs> I told him. God always is gracious. And even when we fail, even when we fall, his hand is always there to lift us up. I invite you to think about what that risk, what God is asking you to risk to get out of that boat. The first step getting out of that boat is indeed the doozy because it takes faith. But you already know what God has done. And you know what God can do. And all of God's people said, I'm going to invite you to